Well, 2022 is officially here, and investors are wondering what this new year has in store for us. How about a 30% market correction and a global recession? But I am preparing to get net short the stock market by the second quarter of this year because I think it's going to be an absolute disaster. If you remember what happened in 2018, in the fall of 2018, when the Fed was quantitative tightening and we're starting to raise interest rates and the credit markets froze, the same thing is very likely to happen in the second quarter of this year. I think there, the stock market has a very high probability of falling 30% in the first half of this year. And I think that 30% decline will be enough to trigger the credit market freeze, the repo market crisis that we saw in 2018, very similar. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Adam Taggart, founder of Wealthion, welcoming you back for an entirely new year of making sense of money in the markets so that you can make better informed decisions about building your wealth. Now, I'm especially excited for today's interview because the last time this guest was on the program, he issued a loud and stark warning that 2022 was going to be a painful year for the markets due to a massive reduction in both monetary and fiscal stimulus. Now, that was back in July. And in the intervening months, his prediction has been increasingly validated by real world events. I'm thrilled to welcome my friend Michael Pinto back to the program and hear his updated outlook for the coming year. Michael, thanks so much for being our first interview guest of 2022. Well, my pleasure to be with you, Adam, as always. Well, thanks, buddy. A special thanks to you for joining us uh, halfway through your recovery from COVID. Um, really appreciate you <laughs> getting yourself off your sick bed to talk to us here. I feel kind of guilty about it. No, it's, it's my pleasure. I just say this, that um, Omicron might not kill you, but it makes you feel like you're half dead or wish you were dead. How's that? Oh, it, it's something, that, it's something you, ju you just don't want to get. I haven't gone to the hospital. I haven't been recorded as someone who has a, a, a positive test. I just, I'm very, very sick and it lingers for a long time. So I really appreciate you having me on and I hopefully will do a good job for you and your audience. Uh, I'm sure you will. Um, thanks for being such a great soldier here. And yeah, for folks watching, uh, you know, take it seriously, folks. You're straight from the horse's mouth as somebody who's dealing with it. Um, all right, Michael. Well, look, let's, uh, I got so many questions for you, but why don't we start with the one I like to ask all my guests right here at the beginning. What is your current assessment of today's global economy and financial markets? Well, you mentioned it uh, in your introduction that I mentioned in the summer of last year that we're headed for a fiscal and monetary cliff in the first half of 22. And here we are, the first quarter of 22. And I'm not changing my mind at all. Just to remind your audience, the Treasury handed out the equivalent of $50,000 to each and every American family on average. Now, I know that not everybody got it. I didn't get it. I'm sure you didn't get any kind of stimulus. Um, but on average, if you divide six trillion by the number of families in America, there's fifty thousand dollars. And if you look what the Federal Reserve did, the Federal Reserve printed four point five trillion dollars since the start of the pandemic. And if you go back just fourteen years, the Federal Reserve printed eight trillion dollars over that time frame. Now it took the Federal Reserve from 1913 all the way to 2008 to amass a Fed balance sheet of $800 billion. And today we stand at $8.8 trillion. What's the Fed's balance sheet? Let's put it in plain English. It's high powered money, Adam. It's the base money supply. Why do they call it the base money supply? Because it's the money supply that all other monetary aggregates are created from. We have a debt-based monetary system. You take that base money supply, which has now gone from 800 million, uh, billion to 8.8 .8 trillion, and you can make loans out the wazoo here. And M1, M2, and M3 will grow exponentially. But we not only just handed this money to Wall Street, we handed it out directly to consumers and businesses. For the first time in history, we engaged in mass helicopter money. And that's why you had all of your inflation. And that, by the way, Adam, led to a 
25% increase in earnings in the S&P 500 during the year 2021. A 45% increase in earnings per share on the S&P 500. So why was that? Again, it's because we had massive and record fiscal and monetary stimuli. That is all gone now in 2022. But here's the thing, here's, here's where we are right now. And I, I, I wanna let you in quickly. I know I have a, a way of rambling, even recovering from COVID, I have a way of rambling. So just say, hey, <laughs> don't worry, it's all give, great. Give me a break, Michael. So listen, the Federal Reserve now is in the process of accelerating the tapering of quantitative easing. So they're originally going to wind it down by $15 uh, uh, billion dollars a month. Now it's $30 billion a month. They will end quantitative easing completely in February of this year. Talk about an accelerated taper program. But it, you know, people say, well, that's not such a big deal, Michael, because you're still looking at an eight, you know, 8.8, 8.9 trillion dollar Fed's balance sheet. But the supply of money that keeps the stock market afloat is going from 120 billion a month to zero. That's pretty bad. But when you add to the fact that that's not the end of the story, Adam, the Federal Reserve now, for the first time in a very long time, is fighting an inflation problem, the greatest inflation problem since 40 years time frame, since 1980, early 1980, 1988, So we have inflation on the consumer price index at 6.8%. Producer prices are close to double digits the way the Fed measures it. So the Fed can't just stop at saying, okay, I'm done tapering QE. Now I could just sit on my, you know, rest of my laurels and hope everything's okay. If the Fed were to get to a neutral or 0% real Fed funds rate, they would have to raise the overnight interbank lending rate to 6.8%. Just to get to zero. So the idea that the Fed is going to sit there and has the luxury, to, uh, okay, we're going to raise maybe uh, an increment 25 basis points here, and maybe we'll wait a few months and do it again. No, that's not going to happen. The Fed must aggressively, this is, this is not Michael Pento's take. This is the take of the FOMC. They're going to aggressively wind down QE earlier. And why? Because they want, they, the whole FOMC committee, every voting member wants the same thing the flexibility to start raising rates immediately, right away, which they, I believe they will raise rates three times next year. And <clears throat> that would normally be a problem. What I, all I just mentioned would be a big problem, but it's an extra problem given the fact that we have the most overvalued stock market in history by a humongous amount. All right. So lots of questions now coming into that. And let's end with that point you just made. So we have a stock market that is historically overvalued and uh, it has been propped up more or less by dependable $120 billion you know, uh, injections of stimulus a month, which is now going away. Um, you talked about the, the $6 trillion in fiscal stimulus uh, that Congress has issued to date since the pandemic hit. And we're seeing that Congress is now having a lot of trouble getting any additional stimulus passed, right? The Build Back Better uh, bill is, is stuck in gridlock at this point in time. Um, and it's inflationary. And, you know, I think politicians are waking up to the fact that people are angry about inflation and that's political kryptonite, right? So uh, if the Fed indeed follows through on tapering to zero and then doing the three rate hikes that you just mentioned here, is that a recipe for a stock market correction slash crash? Can, can the market remain elevated without all that stimulus that's been propping it up for so long? So let me just backtrack a second and, and, and comment on the overvalued stock market. Yes, the stock market is overvalued. But I want to make it a point on this interview to explain it's not just overvalued. It's the most overvalued in history. And it's not just the most overvalued in history. It's the most overvalued in recorded history by a humongous amount. So let me put some numbers to that. 
So if you look at the total market cap of equities to GDP, it's my favorite measurement. It's Warren Buffett's favorite measurement of the valuation of stocks. Today, it sits at 210% of the underlying economy. So let's go back to the, the, the second highest peak, which was in the year 2000. In the year 2000, as I don't have to probably remind you, Adam, the NASDAQ lost 80% of its value over the ensuing two years. The S&P lost almost 50% of its value over the next ensuing two years. Well, the total market cap to GDP back then peaked at 142%. Now we're at 210%. That's a humongous gap between today and the second highest level it ever was before chaos and catastrophe hit the stock market. Again, another measurement, let's, you don't like that measurement, let's just pick price to sales. Price to sales, today it's 3.5. It was 1.77 in 2000. And, those, and that, those two metrics you cannot fake. It's very hard to fake by borrowing money and buying back your shares and lowering the PE ratio. Your, your revenue, you can't really fake revenue. You look, you look at the total market cap, which is, you know, the, the market cap of equities divided by GDP. Okay. That you, you can't fake that. That's, those are the two best real metrics. And that's why I think you say, well, can the Fed just end QE? Well, they ended QE in 2013 and it was a little, little bit of a hiccup. But look at the metrics that I mentioned right now compared to right now, compared to where they were in 2013. Okay, they're not, they're incomparable. You cannot compare the two metrics. So the Fed is now aggressively ending its biggest QE program ever. It's now going to have to rather aggressively raise interest rates because for the first time in 40 years, the inflation rate is 3.4 times. It's silly and asinine 2% target. <laughs> so you can say, well, the Fed wants higher inflation. Well, it does. It, it wants 2%. Remember, it used to be stable prices were 0%. Now stable prices are defined as 2%. Well, now you're at 3.4 times stable prices, according to Jerome Powell. So even if inflation were to dwindle down, attenuate, which I believe it will from 6.8 to say 4 on its own naturally, that's still twice where the Fed is comfortable with inflation. They're going to have to aggressively wind down QE. They're going to have to start at least down the road to raising interest rates. They have no choice because they understand inflation is destroying the middle class and destroying the presidency of Joe Biden. You know, the Federal Reserve chairman is appointed by the president. And there's a lot of seats at the Federal Reserve that need to be reappointed. And these people have to understand, and I think the president understands, at least I hope he does, that inflation is right now destroying the middle, middle and lower classes. So yes, the Fed will be so, aggressive. Can, can I just tug on that for a second? There, there's a conversation I was having yesterday with George Gammon that I think is really interesting here. Because uh, you know, George was asking me basically, um, will the Fed be able to tighten? Because tightening basically means you're probably gonna have a pretty serious market correction. And do they wanna have that in an election year? And of course, the flip side of that is, is, well, they really don't want to have hot inflation, maybe even getting hotter inflation in an election year. Because, um, you know, uh, my answer to this was, look, you know, they don't, ideally they want neither. But if they have to choose, um, you'd probably choose a market correction because uh, I think it's the top 10% of households now own 87% of all financial assets. So, you know, for a ton of voters out there, the stock market isn't super material to them because they just don't own that many stocks, right? But everybody has a household budget and everybody feels the pain of inflation. Um, so here's my question, which is, you know, even if the Fed, you know, gets super serious um, and does everything it said, it's, it, you just said it, 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 it's going to do this year, it's going to taper to zero by February, it's going to start raising interest rates. It takes a while for monetary policy uh, changes to, to you know, impact the real world. Um, I've heard estimates of almost about a year. So it doesn't seem like the Fed can really make people's lives 
materially better between now and when they're going to be voting. So I'm not a political analyst, but it seems to me that, uh, you know, I'd be shocked if the, if the Democrats hold on to their majority, uh, you know, in Congress in this, in this election, um, cause clearly people are upset with the Biden's, uh, administration's handling of inflation last poll I saw, I think it was 69% of the country disapproved of how the administration was handling it. I don't see that getting really much better um, between now and the elections. Um, do you agree with all this? I mean, do you, yeah. do you think that, uh, that, 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 you know, between the two, is the Fed more likely to actually say, yes, we're very serious this time. We don't care if the market throws a fit. They don't, Adam, they don't have the luxury of waiting any longer. And they waited and they dithered and dathered for most of the past 14 years since the Great Recession. Bernanke was the best ditherer in the world. And then he wrote a book about having the courage to act. <laughs> you know, <laughs> courage to act. The, the, listen, the, the $8 trillion increase in the Fed's balance sheet engendered 6.8% CPI, consumer price inflation. Again, I always say it, the way the Fed measures inflation. In reality, we're, at, you know, we're in the double digits. Look at home prices, beef prices, Anything so, you want to look at. So they. So let, sorry, let me just interject with this question. Some people will say, "I don't really believe the Fed's going to tighten because look at their actions in the past. Like look at look at Jerome Powell's pivot back in 2018 when the market threw the taper tantrum. Is the difference this time because inflation, inflation is so much hotter? It, Adam, inflation is different. Throughout that whole dithering of the past 14 years, what, what were they trying to do? The Federal Reserve achieve a two percent inflation target, which they missed. 75% of the time, <laughs> they couldn't get to 2%. And as soon as it got to, uh, anywhere near two, it collapsed back down again. We're not dealing with the hopes of getting to two. The Fed and the Biden administration has to deal with the salient problem that's right in front of them, which is runaway inflation, the highest in 40 years. So they have to deal with that problem. And you add to that, that they have the hubris to believe that, hey, we could just and QE, and then maybe raise rates a few times, and then maybe the stock market will just gradually ease and settle back down, and maybe inflation will ease and settle back down, and maybe e the economic growth rate will ease and settle back down. Everybody will be, you know, fine and dandy. It'll be Goldilocks. I don't believe that's a base case scenario. It's it's an untenable base case scenario. And again, the reason why I say that is because we're not just at a regular stock market valuation. The whole economic construct is artificial, predicated on unprecedented helicopter money handed to people so they can gamble on GameStop and Bitcoin. And, the, you know, the most highly, the highest speculative stocks in the economy. And that artificial construct is going away in 22. So me, I manage money. And listen, I have managed money for many, many years. And I've been licensed as a you know, money manager for 31 years as a uh, SC, and I own an SEC registered RIA. Uh, so I'm no Cassandra. I don't get paid to be a Cassandra. Anybody who wants to look at my returns can ask me and I'll forward them a third party audited returns. Uh, I, I wouldn't be in business if I was someone who says buy gold and short the stock market. Pentaport didn't have several good years here because we were, you know, net short the stock market and hiding in precious metals. I am telling you, I'm going out on a limb. I went out all the way in summer of last year and I wasn't net short the market then, but I am preparing to get net short the stock market by the second quarter of this year because I think it's going to be an absolute disaster. And I will use my 20 point inflation, deflation and economic cycle model to help me make sure I get the timing correct. <laughs> All right, great. So I want to go into, uh, I want to go into your positioning uh, in the second half of this interview, but let me just tug for a little bit more on the macro side of things beforehand. Um, first question, just sort of reading your tone, um, to really bring inflation under control, um, do you think that the number of rate hikes and the way that the Fed is currently looking at it will be sufficient? Or do you think it's going to take much more aggressive rate hikes? You know, maybe not necessarily as high as Volcker took them, but it's going to take that type of seriousness to try to 
stop inflation in this tracks. No, it's not going to take, well, Volcker had to take rates to 20%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but you know, I, I, if I, I, the I, Fed's I, talking I, about three rates this year, if they're all yeah. quarter point rates, is that going to be enough, right? Um, well, um, I, I do believe the odds are very high that the rate of inflation will come down significantly, at least on a second derivative basis, from 6.8% to 4%, just if they end QE and if they raise rates two or three times. What will bring inflation crashing down to, here's the word, deflation, which is a very high probability in 2022, will be a stock market collapse and a credit market freeze. That is my real concern here, Adam. Again, not a Cassandra, not a perma bear or a perma bull on anything. I'm just saying to you that if you remember what happened in 2018, in the fall of 2018, when the Fed was quantitative tightening and we're starting to raise interest rates and the credit markets froze, the same thing is very likely to happen in the second quarter of this year. Okay, so a uh, couple following questions. <laughs> Um, you said uh, stock market crash. You said credit market freeze. Um, you're concerned about those. Um, do you think, and I'm not trying to tie you to a forecast, but do you think that they are probable or just high enough to be concerned about at this point? I, I think if you, you know, see, you know, here I get in trouble putting odds on it. I think the, the, I, the, the odds are high enough for me to proactively now already have uh, very defensive positions in the portfolio. And I'll monitor the credit markets assiduously to see if I'm correct towards March and April timeframe, whether I'm going to go net short the portfolio. But I'll leave it at this. The odds are high enough that I'm already concerned enough to put hedges on in the portfolio. Okay, great. Um, now, you wrote <laughs> a piece recently called The Great Reconciliation of Asset Prices, which you've already kind of laid I think the thesis for kind of already in this conversation, but you know, you think that asset prices are going to come down substantially um, for a lot of the reasons that we talked about. Um, sort of two questions for you, really one question, but two applications. Um, how extreme do you expect these to be, right? So when you talk about asset prices coming down, we've used the term correction, we've used the term crash. What's sort of a ballpark range of which you're thinking, you know, is, is this, 20%? Is it 50%? Is it greater than that? And I think they're, go ahead, sorry. Sorry, and sorry, just the second question is, is recession. So if we do indeed go back into recession, how deep? Will it be a mild one or will it be you know, on par with what we saw in 01 or maybe as deep as what we saw in the Great Recession? What do you think? So I, I think there, the stock market has a very high probability of falling 30% in the first half of this year. I think that 30% decline will be enough to trigger the credit market freeze, the repo market crisis that we saw in 2018, very similar. And when the, when the market dries up for, for instance, high yield junk bonds, <laughs> by, the way, there, there, by the way, there's a record $12 trillion in business debt right now, record high in nominal terms in terms of GDP. The reason why I'm, I sound so negative this year, as opposed to the last few years, where, when I wasn't so um, negatively uh, skewed in my investment style is because we have the most over leverage extended economy and market ever. And uh, it, it, I, I just mentioned, let's just take the fact that the business debt, the $12 trillion in business debt is the, is the lowest yielding debt as far as high yield is concerned. And the, the highest amount of high yield debt ever and the credit quality rating of the entire fixed income spectrum is the lowest ever. So you have the highest amount of debt, the lowest credit rating ever, with the lowest yield ever. So when the credit markets freeze, if they do, the, the economic damage that's going to occur in a very truncated period of time is going to be devastating. So then you ask the question, well, well, that's a recession. You ask the question, how deep can it go? And here's, the, and here's how I'll answer that question, because that's the, that's the ultimate question. Because every other time that the Fed has gotten in trouble, you can go all the way back to, to 1987, Alan Greenspan. You know, when the crash of 87 occurred, um, Alan Greenspan reliquified the markets and that was turned around rather, rather quickly. Every time we've had a problem in the stock market, 
credit market, stock market, economy, anything. What's what the Fed comes to the rescue right away and reliquifies the system. With by the way, with with you know with impunity, they've been able to do that. If we have the same scenario happen again, this time, because we have jumped the shark with inflation, the question I have is: Can the Fed then reliquify the banking system, monetize trillions of dollars of treasury debt? Because I, by the way, I have no doubt in my mind that Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema and every Republican and every Democrat will all vote the same way when we have the next credit crisis. They will earmark trillions of dollars to go out and helicopters will be flying all over, all over again and Powell will, will retreat. But what happens to the long end of the bond market and what happens to the currency this time around? Because they'll fool no one, Adam, where they should be able to fuel, fool very few people that the Fed can ever drain its balance sheet, even a, even a minute amount, or do anything to support the dollar or um, our sovereign bond market. How does the Fed encourage an environment where people are sanguine and comfortable investing in a 10-year treasury note at 1.6% when inflation is 6.8% and now we're going to be told it's going much higher? So what you could have is a temporary cessation of, of chaos in the stock market. But then my eyes will be right on the bond market. And to see, I, I want to see how high does that yield go? Is it, does it rise intractably because inflation gets out of hand, which then causes the stock market to melt down even faster? Or, or has everything been able to be you know, tractable by the Federal Reserve by monetizing trillions of dollars all over again? That's the big question. And there's a doubt in my mind as to how easily the Fed can reconcile things after the next credit crisis ensues. Yeah, and Michael, you're a much greater expert in this than I am. But but yeah, I mean, if, if the Fed is tightening uh, and draining liquidity to fight inflation, uh, it really does have a lot more limitations on it to try to step in and rescue things if a recession you know, starts to hit. Um, I know it's more complicated than that, but still fundamentally, that just sort of seems like the box that they're in there. So um, it's gonna be super interesting. Now I know that politicians are gonna wanna step in and stimulate because that's how they show that they're doing something. And I'm sure the population is gonna say, yes, please stimulate us because we got rent payments this month and we got to put food on the table. But it may just be you know, the, the worst medicine that we need because <laughs> it would make the, the overall problem even worse. So, um, all right, well, look, so um, you, you've, you've basically rung the warning bell here that um, you see probability as uncomfortably high that we're gonna have a substantial market correction likely in, or, or possibly in this year that could then lead to a uh, credit market freeze and, and then lead to a recession. And, and I guess I wanna tug on one thing that you mentioned too, you talked about our over leveraged um, uh, economy you know, where we're just so used to, to super cheap, I mean, record, historically low record cheap uh, debt. Um, if those rates start rising, this is this sort of similar in some ways to the 2008 uh, bubble bursting where, you know, we had all that bad housing debt that was out there. And then once things started really breaking down, um, everybody who had those adjustable rate mortgages all of a sudden had to refinance at higher rates and then just couldn't, right? Where We've got corporate America that is basically, you know, funding itself by just rolling over debt, you know, because it's been so cheap, um, and and oftentimes using that cheap debt to then do stock buybacks to boost its share price higher. Um, you know, all of a sudden, higher interest rates might kill that that buyback effect, and then more importantly, might destroy a lot of these companies, um, particularly the high yield market, as you were talking about, um, because they just can't make their debt service payments. I mean, are, 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 are you concerned about sort of that type of, of contagion? Well, 20% of uh, companies now are zombie companies. So they actually have to issue new debt to pay the interest on existing debt. Um, so the whole construct is artificial, as I mentioned, and it's predicated on these very low and artificially induced interest rates. Now, how that goes away, either the Fed raises rates and kills the economy, or inflation raises interest rates and kills the stock market and the economy. Either way, 
that's the trap we have we have set ourselves. And you know, you, you mentioned um, 2008 and and the mortgage crisis. Well, we have an adjustable rate payment on our treasury complex. Um, you know, they're not, they're not you know 30 year fixed is one thing, but we have T bills we have to roll over constantly too. Um, and uh, you can't roll over T bills at zero percent or very close to zero percent interest rates if your inflation rate is headed for double digits and everybody knows that. So you could end up with a situation like we had in 2012 in, in Greece, where you know their short-term interest rates went into the you know the 40% range. Um, Mario Draghi was able to placate that interest rate um, revolt because deflation was a salient issue back then. Um, but again, we don't have that luxury any longer. And you can't tell me, I mean, li listen, Adam, you know better than most people. How did we get into the situation of 6.8% inflation CPI in the first place? Well, we got there because we told people, hey, you stay home, don't do anything, and we'll send you a check. And Mr. Uh, Powell, you'll print it for us, okay? Well, that's how we got here. Um, if that happens again, people understand, wait a second, I mean, I, I, I don't have to go to work and I expose myself to a virus or you know, getting my fingers dirty. Um, I, all I have to do is sit home and wait for the mailman to come or for more accurately for the numbers to hit my bank account. Um, and we can get into the whole argument about you know, a, a digital coin coming from our central bank too, which would actually help the non-banked people. There's, a, there's, a, there's a many, many people here in this country who are non-banked. Um, they don't have a bank account. They, they can't get a check from the government, but they can get a wallet, a digital wallet from Mr. Powell and, uh, and he could fund that without even the okay of the treasury. So these are the things you, you start thinking about and you say, wait a second, what does the stock market look like? Um, and what do you own? That's the whole you know, basis of how I invest, second derivative of inflation and growth. What do you own if the scenario plays out where we have this period of disinflation that morphs into deflation and a stock market crash? Where you'd want to, you know, overweight bonds and bond proxies and own the four horsemen of the economic apocalypse that I like to talk about often. Um, but what happens on the other end of this if we have a whole generation of people now who, who are, you know, given money to stay home and not be productive? So a, a generation of bottlenecks and inexorably rising inflation and intractably rising interest rates. Well, you wouldn't want to own bonds <laughs> or bond proxies in that environment, but you better own base metals and energy. So it's going to be a year of, uh, of dynamic changes in the stock market. Uh, reality, I think, is going to hit in a big way in the second quarter. And if you're in that 60-40 kind of buy and hold portfolio um, and you've been told it inculcated by your advisor for, you know, decades or whatever years, however old you are, hey, the market always comes right back. Well, guess what, Adam? Hey, the market always doesn't just come right back. It didn't come right back in Japan in 89. It didn't come back in China in 2007. We're still waiting for that. It took years and years after 2008 to come back. Again, that's when we had the luxury to throw trillions of dollars at the problem without creating inflation. Well, we already have that problem with inflation. Right, right. And, and I think, you know, we've been so conditioned over the past decade plus um, by the Fed put to just buy the dip, right? And so we've, we've trained, I mean, really we've trained an entire generation of investors. Don't fight the Fed, the Fed's got your back. Just be long and when the market dips, just get even longer, right? And even the response back in February and March of 2020, you know, reinforce this, which is, yeah, we had a stock market correction, but you know, it only lasted about four weeks, right? And, then, and then, then we had one of the best market performances ever, right? And so that's what people are conditioned for. And what I hear you saying, Michael, is, is those people might be really unpleasantly surprised uh, when they learn that, uh, you know, the Fed's abil magic ability or the market's magic ability to, to leap off the, the mat every time it gets knocked down. Um, it may not materialize this next time. Um, one, because we've got lots of historical precedent for that, but also because of inflation, right? Inflation was a low relatively in January of 2020. It's now super high. The Fed and Congress can't just magically step in right away 
with stimulus guns ablazing because they're going to make the inflation problem even worse. Exactly, exactly right. Well put. But yeah. we, again, we have lost that luxury of waiting and dithering with interest rate hikes and the ending of quantitative easing. All right. So you've already taken the conversation in the direction I, I was hoping to bring it next, which is, okay, we've freaked out a lot of people with the first half of this interview. <laughs> we've opened a lot of eyes to the risk factors uh, here in 2022. Um, and geez, we're only four days into the new year here, but we're already sort of talking about some pretty dark days ahead. Um, let's talk about intelligent ways to prepare for what's coming. Our interview with Michael Pento continues over in part two, which will be released tomorrow as soon as we're through editing it. To be notified when it comes out, subscribe to this channel if you haven't already by clicking on the subscribe button below, as well as the little bell icon right next to it. Be sure to click the like button too while you're at it. And if Michael's warning about the probability of both a market correction and a recession has got your attention, then be sure to register for Wealthion's approaching online conference on January 22nd. The focus of the conference will be how investors just like you can safely navigate the challenges ahead in 2022. And the speakers we've got lined up are just tremendous. Jim Grant, Jim Rickards, Lacey Hunt, Luke Groman, Danielle DiMartino Booth, Rick Rule, Brent Johnson, Tavi Costa from Crescent Capital, just to name a few. And they'll be joined by experts on real estate, farmland, precious metals, and the blockchain. You want to act now while the early bird price discount of over 40% off is still available. To learn more about the event, and as well as to register for it, just go to Wealthion.com slash Jan 2022. Okay. I'll see you next in part two of our video interview with Michael Pento.